Well, good evening, everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you again um, going on to this, uh, this session here on July 26th. This is part one of a 79-part series on strategic planning. Uh, we'll, we'll do part two here in, in a couple of weeks. This is a, a follow-up to some of the things that I did in, in Power Summit giving you a chance to really take a, a deep dive with me in terms of kind of how I approach the, the strategic planning process. This is, I view this as more of a Q&A and a piece and kind of walking it through, kind of building this along the way, as opposed to me just purely doing more of a presentation style that I did in, the, in Power Summit. So, I'm sorry? Bob, what was that question? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought I was on mute. I'm in the car and I have my headphones in. I just asked my wife if she wanted to listen to me. <laughs> I well, I hope, I hope both you and your wife would listen to it, but that's a, that's a, that's a discussion for another day. You've got my attention. <laughs> Thanks so much. So starting kind of at the beginning, is, is there is there anybody that has any questions uh, about kind of the newly revised uh, strategic planning map that, that got built with the, the last iteration? And Bob, I apologize that you're not gonna have a visual on this one and, or you're li not likely to, if, depending on whether you're in the driver's seat or the passenger seat. Any questions about that before we start? I am in a passenger seat and I did see it. Thank you. Okay. Going once, going twice. Well, Doug, I saw it when you held it up, but I don't know that I've seen it any other time than you just now holding it up. And so what should I know about it? All right, so there's a couple of, there's a, I probably, you know what, let me, uh, let me do a screen share with you, Tom, it'll be easier. I'm, I'm just going to, this is available a couple of different spots, but at the, it's also on the Paradigm website if you get stuck. Just give me one second. Screen share, here we go. All right, so with the, this map that you see uh, on the screen was modified from the very first process. So if you look at, if you look at the equivalent of the, the gray book, if you will, that you may see uh, a different map, why? Well, where the, where the majority of the changes are, were the repositioning of mission and the old definition of mission now is much closer to corresponding to intermediate milestones. And we've added some of the elements that you may read about in a book like Traction or stuff like that so that so that there's now an ongoing way of turning this um, forward and helping people use this to drive their business results. So for example, on the, when you get down into the intermediate milestones, that is typically the, the 18 to 36 month, hey, let's pretend we're running a business here. What are you really trying to accomplish? You can almost think about it as a super goal. And again, I don't want to get too ahead of myself here, but I just want to give you a context for the map. When I was watching people go from the old mission to business goals, there was never any process in there to identify what do we actually need to do to be able to make those, that old mission come true. So on this particular one, we added an, an obstacle identification step, the same way we wouldn't go from goals to action steps without thinking in terms of obstacles. I just wanted to use that parallel piece. So whether we're talking about the goal setting process or whether we're talking about the strategic planning process, 
there's in there's internal congruency and in, in terms of our our approach the goals in key results is a slightly different treatment but i'd prefer to kind of talk about that later in the in the process all of those things then become okay how do we actually turn this from a thought document into what are we going to actually do to run the business and that's really where the whole execution piece comes thinking about the the whole idea of having team goals and divisional goals again it's not inconsistent with what we've been talking about forever in terms of the leadership and the management and team supervision and so on processes that we've always talked about umbrella goals and divisional or departmental goals down to individual goals this parallels that so when you start to take a look at what are those team things that you're going to do the only difference is these goals and key results tend to be more driven by a 90 day window for the most part or a 30 day or a 90 day window versus what do we want to do for a year and a half because it's really hard for most people to really keep themselves focused on something for 18 months without intermediate points along the way. Those teams get broken down to individual goals and what kinds of accountabilities are going to be. And that's no different than in any other process um, that we have. The only two nuances on here are kind of a quarterly theme. If it's possible to have your organization kind of all focusing on the same thing. So if you want to have um, the equivalent of customer engagement scores go up, what has to happen throughout the organization? So it's not just a customer service department issue. What does the finance department need to do to be able to, to, raise, to contribute to those scores? Think about them as in the, in the customer loyalty program, we'll talk about points of connection, right? So if you think about this from a points of connection perspective, how are all the various elements of the organization contributing to the success of those goals? So this is not, well, these are Doug's goals and these are Lauren's goals. Yeah, but how do, how do they all gel at the top you know, so that there's consistency kind of across the organization where possible? The other thing that's a, that's a different piece in, on this particular map is we always went, we always went from, the, from the vision and then the discussion of values. That didn't change. The mission was, was kind of now kind of put in as so that it's really kind of consistent with almost any other planning models, vision, that mission and vision tend to be at the, at the kind of the front end where we used to have the vision at the top and the mission down kind of as the, the first step of the, the operating process or the execution process. Um, I became so tired of fighting that battle with people saying, oh, no, no, that's not what a mission is. A mission is this. It's like, you know what, don't fight City Hall. I mean, don't make it sound like our process is so unique that we're uniquing ourselves right out of business. Um, so, so the vision and the mission are kind of the what and the how or the what and the why, the big why. The internal and, uh, internal and uh, uh, external assessment processes haven't changed dramatically. Steve, I see your hand up. What do you got? So, um, Doug, I really um, like the fact that mission has changed in kind of the, the definition of what we're doing and trying to keep it more in keeping with strategic planning lingo that most people um, are using. But I still feel that oftentimes the mission, as opposed to this diagram where vision and, and through values um, is defining the mission, I actually think that in many ways, the mission and values help to, um, help to inform what the, mission, the vision will be. And so rather than having the vision, the mission be uh, an extension of the vision, um, I always think, in the way in which I think of strategic planning and the way in which I deal with my clients, that the mission is the why and the vision is, is this, this, this picture of the future. And it really comes out of really understanding the why the organization is doing what it's doing. Um, so Steve, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fight you on that. The, uh, 
I mean, to me, there's, an, there's enough consistency there and considering that all three of those pieces really make up the, the basic foundation. Um, mm -hmm. One of the challenges that I've had, and that's a small C challenge, not a large C challenge, is if you're dealing with a startup versus if you're dealing with an established organization when you're going through this process, there's a lot of stuff that they've already kind of talked through and thought about over the years. And so how much of that are they willing to kind of throw away and start again? So I try to uh, enter those kinds of dis discussions with some sensitivity that I never want to give them the impression that everything that they've ever done in their former life is as dumb as a box of rocks. And thank God they met me. So, so I have to use a little, I try to use a little discretion, if you will, in terms of kind of approaching that. So it's something that they're comfortable with. And I got to admit, I'm really flexible in terms of, of kind of what they finally settle on. Because I, 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 I try to really stay true to the, the, the idea that we're facilitating this process. We're not necessarily consulting with them in the technical aspects of their business. And so I try to keep somewhat of a bright line in terms of have they hired me as a consultant or have they hired me as a process facilitator? I don't know whether that helps your, whether that helps the additional, those words it actually does. help or hurt. It does. And um, I was just part of a team that was trying to pr produce a strategic planning process. Um, and we couldn't come to I we couldn't come to to some common understanding of when the vision, when in the process is the vision finalized, or there's consensus around a vision. And my colleagues said that the vision continues to evolve as you get through these various um, um, internal external assessments and process evaluation and it will continue to evolve. And I, I keep going back to this idea that the vision has to be pretty well have consensus around up front. Otherwise you, you can't go through all the rest of the stuff. But, um, but I'd like to hear your version of that as part of a, a kind of an engaged approach to strategic planning. And when does the vision, when does a consensus vision statement actually happen? I'll speak to that, but let me give it Charles that since his hand went up before you finish your question. You know, I just, just in terms of what, delivering a plan, I think you have to loop back. Um, I, think, I think you can come to a consensus quickly on what a vision is, but that can change after you actually look at the external internal data. You have to keep looping, looping back and looking at it uh, just to make sure it's a sanity check. That's kind of where I'm coming from. I try to get clarity on the vision and I, and I literally will take that the equivalent of the sheet of paper that it's printed on and start every session with, let me just almost kind of like the old gentleman, this is a football thing. So this is, this is the vision. This is kind of the working copy of the vision, you know, any qualms about it. And, and if I was working with the, uh, the 13 of you on the call, I would literally be kind of going around the room saying, Wendy, are you okay with that? Chuck, you still okay? Steve, Lauren, Mike? Because I really want to make sure that, that people are, that are not just going, I'm bored with this, I want to move on. Because to me, there's going to be a lot of other decisions that are going to take place based on what's really in here. And if they don't believe it at the front end of the process, what's the likelihood that they're ever going to, you know, believe it at the back end of the process? And if the executive team doesn't believe it, how believable, do, you know, do we expect it to be, you know, throughout the organization? So it's, so I don't want to just go through the paper chase. And I know there's a whole bunch of people that go, hey, you know, put something down. That's good enough. Good. Next because they, they really want to get to the operating plan. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that I stumbled on is when somebody uses the phrase strategic planning, my experience has been that little two-word phrase 
has meant a lot of different things to a lot of different people over the years. And so Wendy knows that in some cases, I will work the process exactly the way you see it in front of you. But I've also had a modification that if I was working, and I'm just going to, Steve, just because I happen to be looking at you, I will, if I was working in Steve's organization, and basically there, I didn't expect them to change their business very much. Kind of the, the, the foundational elements. I might actually say, what well, you're not really interested in a strategic plan because you're really not trying to reinvent the business. You know what business you want to be in. You understand who your competitors are. I mean, you're kind of long in the tooth in terms of getting you know, gathering consumer data, you know, in competition data, you're not trying to reinvent your business. So to make sure that you're not using an elephant gun to kill a mosquito, I might, I may reposition this as what you're really talking about doing is updating the operating plan, which most people have a tendency to think of 12 to 18 months more than I want to kind of invent, take a fresh look at inventing the business. And so if I find out that somebody really doesn't have a strategic plan because they've never really gone through that process and wants one, I'm more likely to go through the map as you see it kind of start to finish. If this is one of those things that they've been doing strategic planning for years, whether it's every two years, every three years, or every five years, but they've probably, if there's not significant upheaval in their industry, and that's not a loaded statement. I mean, there's some industries, as you know, that are much more stable than others. If there hasn't been significant upheaval in their industry, they may not need the, the first couple of pieces of this process. And by trying to take them on a forced march, because it's something that we want, but it's not necessarily something that they want, you can start to erode the power of the process. So I, I always really try to start from where they are. And oftentimes, when I'm talking with somebody about as soon as they start, if I think it's even remotely going down the strategic planning path, I have this on the Paradigm website for a reason. And, and I literally use this as a talking document exactly the way I'm talking with you guys about it right now that said, you know, strategic planning has meant a lot of different things. Would it be helpful if I kind of walk you through our overall approach to strategic planning so that I know kind of what is it that you're really trying to accomplish here and making sure that all of these pieces in here are really going to be value added to them. Because if they're not, we're gonna start getting resistance when we're trying to go through it. And then it becomes a force of will between ourselves and them. And, and I just don't see that as a, a healthy way to start a relationship. So I'd much rather kind of give them what they want. But if I don't ask those questions on the front end, then I'm making assumptions about where they are. And I found more often than not, I have, a, I have more than a 50-50 shot at being wrong. So I'd just rather ask the questions and get clarity on it um, before I start. Charles? Just as part of the actual selling process of the plan, I mean, isn't it usually a question to ask them what they want to change? Uh, usually, um, but again, remember my selling process typically kind of has a little bit of a kind of a, uh, a front end with, you know, with the 16 slides that most, if not all of you have seen at one point or the other. So a lot of times people come back and say, tell me a little bit about this strategic planning process. And then I'll typically kind of ask why, you know, do they have one, oh, okay. and, you know, in, in, if they don't have one, why do they think a strategic plan would help them? So I almost, I literally almost do the equivalent of a reverse sale. Rather than trying to talk them into one, they have to talk me into why I should do strategic planning with them. 
I mean, because I, I want to make sure that there's really a there there and it's not just a, a check the box thing because that's get that gets really old really fast. Um, and just one more comment about what you're doing. Um, I've seen, and I've done this with organizations, just take the vision statement they have, you know, word for word and just ask them, are they okay with it? Is there anything that needs to change? And oftentimes you'll get dialogue just out of that. Yep. I, I agree with you whole, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, so, so once, to me, the, the vision values and mission really create the lens through which all of the other questions are being asked and answered. So that it's never just an appendage that's kind of sticking out on its own. To me, the beauty of what I really, really love about this process is there are truly no ramps to nowhere in this process. Every, everything that's in here ties. And I just wanna make sure that between today's session and, and part two or part 17, if that's what it takes to be able to make this work, that everybody understands, oh, I see how the answers here fit into this part later on in the process. And so if I do, if I give something short shrift on the front end of that, there's a high likelihood it's going to bite me in the lower part of my anatomy later on in the process. So, so as long as you're aware, I mean, you can still make a decision to do that, but I just want to make sure that kind of forewarned is forearmed, as long as you're aware that if you start to skip these elements of these steps, it's kind of like that old ad, you know, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. Because one way or the other, you're probably going to end up having to, uh, to kind of fix those skipped steps. And what we know about quality is it's usually easier to fix it on the front end than trying to inspect it out on the back end. And a lot less costly. So that's... That's a little bit in terms of uh, kind of the, this top part of the map. What's this whole stuff in here with CFS and process evaluation? Um, that one is pro that was one that I spent a significant amount of time on, I believe, on Power Summit, or at least on one of the two sessions of Power Summit. But the long and the short about that is, if you think about where my head is usually in terms of, I have to really try to get my arms wrapped around, or what are the obstacles? And while I talked about obstacles down here, in my head, this process, the CFS process piece up here is another step of helping them down the obstacle identification path. I just don't call it that. What I found was with these critical success factors, which again, five, a maximum of eight, all independent, not connected with, and in any one of those, but they, they really kind of uh, stand that acid test that even if somebody did a great job of identifying those, what I found was they didn't always, they didn't always have the, the experience, because I don't want to say capacity. I think it tends to be the prior experience to look at their own organization holistically. They had a tendency to look at it through kind of their lens or their prior history in terms of what, what functions they may have served in the past. And so I was looking for a vehicle that would kind of help people step back and take an objective look at the organization. And so we added this CFS process evaluation piece, and there's really two pieces of it. It's, these are the thing, these are the five to eight things that we say we have to do, have to do. And typically they go along the top of this uh, spreadsheet that Wendy and Jenna send you when you have, when you sign up for this process. And down the side is a generic detailed list. If you're allergic to detail, you're not going to like this process. Let me tell you that right, right up front but it's a detailed but generic list of all kinds of little elements that over the years, people have watched derail 
a company, a process, or a business result. And so what this does in the cold light as opposed to the white hot heat when people have a proverb, you know, their head in a vice, the design of this thing was let's take a look at where could we be vulnerable? Are there some things that we don't even think about on a day in and day out basis? <clears throat> that if something went sideways could really screw up our ability to execute this plan. And so it talks about everything from consolidation of real estate to HR policies, to bringing new products to market, to the whole IT infrastructure telephony piece. I mean, I would never use this piece with a company of eight people. I mean, it would just be ridiculous. But some of us, you know, some of us do work with mid-sized or larger organizations. And almost nobody has a has a, a something where where there's somebody looking at all of the white space in between the silos. That almost there's almost no organization that I've talked with that actually ever has anybody responsible for looking for that at that white space in between the silos. And we all know that's where the issues happen. That's where the disconnects happen. That's where the, the, the feeling of sand in the gears happen. So I thought, you know what? Before anybody gets vested in, so to speak, in all of these outcomes, let's give them an opportunity to kind of take the heat off and say, these are all the things that your organization is likely involved in, to be involved in, whether you realize them or not. Which of these things could have an impact on your ability to execute the, the, the critical success factors? And I didn't, when I built this thing, I didn't care whether they wanted to score them A to F, one, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one, one to 100. It didn't matter. I mean, I didn't care what tool, what uh, measurement tool evaluation they wanted to give it. To me, the fact that it surfaced and somebody goes, ooh, you know, our, our lo warehouse logistics systems may not be able to handle where we're trying to go in terms of our competitive position. Well, isn't it better to have that discussion earlier then absolutely later, and that's going to cause the thing that caused the 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 the, uh, the 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 plan to never be executed. So I've tried to sow that seed way up front. That said, all right, these are the things that you say you have to do on your business to make the mission and vision come true unequivocally. Where are there's an where is there any kind of an intersection between those operating areas and the critical success factors so that you can start to begin to say, hey, are there so many, are there, what things, if any, are we truly color in red if you wanted to go red, yellow, green? What are those things that are color in red that we better really start to take, you know, take into consideration? Because if we have all kinds of things here that are really major deal breakers, then shouldn't we take that into consideration when we're setting our 12 to 18 month intermediate goals or operating goals? Because otherwise we're setting the whole organization up to lose. We're, we're basically saying, we're giving you mission impossible. Have a, next, have a nice day, I'll see you in a year and a half. So that's, that's why those things are, 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 are in there. Again, would I use it for a micro business? No. Um, I mean, are there things, I mean, there's even things in there that if, that if, I, if, some, if an organization's IT infrastructure is really critical to an organization and think about somebody like a GE or a Lockheed, just to pick two household names, that's not something that can be just kind of 
oh yeah, well, someday we'll get, a, we'll get along to take a look at that. I mean, those things are, those things can derail a plan even and of itself. So it, it's really, it's really trying to raise awareness of, hey, is this something that somebody better be paying attention to or isn't it? And I, and quite candidly, I don't care whether the answer is yes or no. My goal is just to literally try to surface it to minimize the chances that they're going to get caught short at the worst possible time. So let me, that was a long, 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 long answer, but let me take a breath and kind of find out what, if any questions has that prompted in your mind? Michael? So you mentioned that you wouldn't use this for a micro business of like eight people. Probably not. Well, so two, not, 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 the, not the CFS process evaluation spreadsheet. Okay. I mean, you can, but just be prepared to, depending on how, sorry, depending on how sophisticated they are, um, it may be using an elephant gun to kill a mosquito. But would you use the basic process minus that, or maybe a more top level one of those? Yep. So um, would, I mean, I, I would give, I would share, I would potentially share it with them, mm. but I don't want them to feel like this is going to be so overwhelming and right. it doesn't relate to them that it starts to um, undercut the value of the process. I, everything that I try to, prov to provide, including what questions in the magic book I ask and which ones I skip, I make that decision on, on is this going to be a discussion that's going to be valuable or am I just kind of going through the motions of acting as a court stenographer filling out the book? Mm. Um, I have no desire to be a court stenographer. So I have no problem. If, if you use this as a Sherpa guide, if you use this as a, as a piece of latex that needs to be bent and stretched to to deal with the reality of what's going on in that company, as opposed to something that's done in marble or concrete that's unchangeable. I really look at this as, as, as a series of tools or as a series of things to help people discover and uncover things that they may or may not have ever even realized about their business. Is that helpful at all? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, it kind of leads to a couple other questions. For a startup company, at what point in their life cycle would you start using this and what modifications would you make for a startup as opposed to a company that's been around for say 10 years? I'm gonna answer that question like this. With a startup, what's the experience of the people that are starting it up? Because if they're pretty seasoned mm -hmm. executives, are, and this is not going to be their first rodeo, I could almost jump in and go, let's go. Because I know they're going to understand the language. They're going to understand the impact of some of the things that we've talked about. If, if basically somebody became unemployed at the mid or lower level of an organization, and now they're starting a company so that they can buy themselves a job, how much do you really think they're going to know about competitive positioning? you probably could fill a thimble and still have room left over, right? So, um, so, I, so I try to take that into, in, into consideration. If somebody is a relatively young entrepreneur, have nothing to do with chronological age, but more or less with experience, meaning corporate, ex corporate executive experience and so on, I absolutely love the ELST process from trusted advisors because it gives them a lot of really good solid things to think about on the text portion of this process. And then the workbook piece is really what makes the text piece come alive. Um, I spend a lot less time talking about the text stuff if somebody's been living in the land of strategic planning for the last 20 years, it's like, 
I know that they they're hiring me to help them build the plan, get to the plan, you know, get to the executable plan. Versus if somebody's not, it's much. They're really hiring me for the guidance of hey, what things do I need to, to you know to be taken into consideration as I'm kind of building this along the way. Um, so those are the those are something. Mean, some of it is experiential, Michael. I'll be the first to admit. Um, but that's kind of where that's kind of my thought process as I'm kind of getting ready to send an order at the blonde at the top of the screen that says, Wendy, this is what I want. This is what I need it. Can you include this and can you not include this? Yeah, I'm 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 kind of making those decisions pretty on purpose. Yeah, no, thanks, Doug. I, I appreciate the insight that it's a function of the individual you know, knowledge, experience, and maturity, as opposed to the company. Got it. Charles, you're on mute. I, Charles, I you may as well take yourself off of mute, because you and I are going to be talking a lot. I can see it. I struggle with this section, and, and I, I think you have to be big enough that you actually have processes. <laughs> I mean, like, like a startup doesn't, they don't think that way. Right. Uh, well, again, actually, depending on their background. But I, I kind of struggle. Is this just too much information? Like if it really is a business, a corporation with multiple business units, can, can you really do that process across all, all of the corporation? Or, or would you break it down into a business unit, each doing their own analysis? I tend to use it by... Uh, kind of what? Where's the PNL fall? I tend to do it based on like okay. the equivalent of a divisional PNL because otherwise it becomes unwieldy. Gotcha. Yeah, that'd, that'd be my thought. Thanks. You got it. Any other any other uh, big picture questions before I go into some detail? Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing this for now. So kind of starting at the basic foundation level, kind of the why are we in business? Th that's been fascinating over the, over the course of time. Um, the answers are as varied as, as, as the number of clients that I've worked with. Almost regardless of how they answer the question. One of the things I always do is I always share a quote that, and, and I this may have come from Drucker, but there's a high likelihood it came from a, a Stanford guy um, whose name just popped in and out of my mind. Um, but the purpose of every organization is to attract and maintain Satis loyal, satisfied customers while generating adequate profitability today and improved profitability in the future. The purpose of every organization is to attract and maintain loyal, satisfied customers while generating adequate profitability today and improved profitability in the future. And <laughs> well, it, it's either him, it, it literally is either him or. Um, there, there was a there was a Stanford professor that had to, that had said something very similar, um, but I'm not I'm not arguing with you, Charles. Um, but I use that because a lot of times when people come come at this in terms of why are we in business, it's all about us. And so I can ask the question, kind of, kind of in this, why are we in business piece? Where's the customer fit into that? And oftentimes it's, oh, well, we really haven't taken any of those into them into consideration. And if they haven't, how long are they likely to have a sustainable business? Sometimes they go back and they change their language. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they'll modify it slightly. I mean, I'm, I've never asked anybody to scrap their answer to that question and just insert what I just told you. But I love the idea of both attracting as well as maintaining. And I get that honestly enough. I worked with a CPA firm that shall remain nameless and they were wonderful 
that once they had a client, they kept them damn near forever. But they were absolutely crappy when it came to go out and developing new business. So they they all they had every reason in the world, you know, as soon as they rearranged their, their sock drawer alphabetically by height, then they might be able to have time, you know, to go out and develop, you know, a new client. And I've worked with other organizations that quite candidly, they can bring in business like it's going out of style. They bring them in the front door and lose them out the back door. So what I love about that quote is it's about not only attracting, but it's also about maintaining those loyal, satisfied customers. And it's got the word profit in it, right? So the people say, well, we're in business to make money. Okay, it talks about generating you know, adequate profitability now and improved profitability in the future. Some of that improved profitability comes from kind of how are you keeping and growing satisfied customers. So to me, there's a lot of magic in those couple of sentences. And I do try to make sure that, that I don't do a lot of ch chalk talks, if you will, during the strategic planning process. But that's one, if you followed me around on almost every single client that I've had, I talk that through with them because I'm, I'm thinking about if that helps them with a kind of a helpful philosophical underpinning in terms of why are we going through this, this piece so that they've got context to, to kind of hang things, to hang things on. Uh, any, any, any questions on, on that? Okay. Um, what are our short and long-term objectives? The, uh, the, the first question that I ask them is what does short and long-term mean to you? Because I've had some people that have kind of defined long term as kind of more than you know ten years out. The most popular answer tends to be five years. That they have a tendency anything beyond five years tends to be they tend to see as long term. But it's really interesting that when you say okay, so if if long term is is five years or three year five years usually, what does short you know what are your short what how do you define short term? And they almost always are thinking about 18 months to three years. Again, your mileage may vary. You know, there's more than one right answer on this thing. Um, but those tended to be the kind of the, if I was kind of putting them on a, on a bar graph, those would be the spots where I, where I see the, the, the spikes. Um, and some of those kinds of things can be everything from an entrepreneur that's looking to hit the escape valve, you know, in terms of, you know, my, my five-year objective is to have this, this company available for sale if I decide to sell it, or if, if my son or daughter or offspring decide not to get into the business or niece or nephew or relative of some sort, uh, I, wanna, I want this to, to be a, an asset that, assets that's sellable. Um, some people can be, listen, I want this business in five years to be a spot where somebody could take it over. Or, you know, I, I want this business to be a spot where we could turn it into an ESOP, to, you know, to reward some of our long-term clients that have worked with us forever. Um, I want this to, to be in a spot, you know, in a position where we can, we can buy out another organization. I mean, so those are some of the kinds of things, some of the kinds of answers you know, that I've heard over the, over the course of time. Um, obviously, those things begin to even kind of put some walls around kind of what kinds of things are probably going to be on or off the table during the, during the process. It gives you context for kind of how they may answer some of the other, um, some of the other questions. But going back to the point you just made about, uh, Oil customers. Uh, um, when when people say five years, I want I want to flip the business. It seems like when you hear these long term goals, it's always about them. It's you know what what do they want to achieve? Um, but it seems like the limiting factor, at least in strategic planning, is how far out can they see into the market. And, and I've I've found that in a in a like a technology market, which is really changing fast. Seeing past three years is damn near impossible. Mm -hmm. um, and so then the question that then comes for a short term is what's what's their cycle turn on product development? Uh, I, I would agree with I would agree with both of those appraisals. Yeah, it's always based on the industry. And, you know, and how much how much um, 
how much revolutionary change and how much evolutionary change has the industry gone through? I mean, most of you know, I've got a client um, in Wisconsin that's basically in, in the truck and railroad business. And just, you know, to put it in perspective, the railroads are still running on the same size tracks that basically the chariots were built on in Rome. So to talk about an industry that's not exactly fast changing is the understatement of the century. If you compare that to a tech startup or a software startup or a software as a service startup with, with what day is it, you know, um, that's how they measure their change. That's a whole different, that's a whole different discussion. I see Cleveland is, is in lurk mode, but he does a lot of work with the U.S. government, and so does is the so does Nancy. So you think about how you know how fast you know do government agencies tend to change, in general, not very quickly, right? So I've been in that space too. <laughs> that's true. Five you know, years. Five so, years. <laughs> you know, so so to always kind of say what's the, the what's the real context, and I, and I would say you know what I'm, as long as we can kind of keep. Oh gosh, excuse me. As long as we can kind of keep our eyes open in terms of what things are would make, you know, if we were that person that, that's sitting across the table, gosh, excuse me, that we're sitting across the table from us, what kinds of what would the noise be going in our head in terms of what kinds of things are relevant and what kinds of things are not? And again, if you kind of look at yourself as a, a Sherpa to kind of assist people to go where they're trying to go. I find that that that's a lot that's different than if they think that I'm trying to take them on some kind of a forced march with a, with or without their permission. And I always like to think, Doug, about, and I can't find this documented anymore. I found it once that AT&T's vision in the 1920s was connect the world. Hmm. And lots and lots of technology has changed since the 1920s. But that vision, I mean, assuming that we're still an AT&T lot, but that would still hold. And, yeah. You know, uh, thanks, Mike. The, you know, uh, another great example of that in, in my perspective is, uh, and, unless it's changed, the vision for Florida Power and Light used to be power at the flip of a switch. Meaning that, you know, that wherever, wherever you were, whatever you wanted, when you flip that switch, something happens and it's the desired outcome you want. And well, you could go, well, duh. Yeah, but think of, think of the challenges that, that Florida Power and Light would face between hurricanes and fires, you know, and at one point, I forget the number of people that were moving into Florida a year, but, or I mean a month, but I thought at one point it was 50,000 new people a month were moving into Florida. Imagine building, having the infrastructure that was flexible enough to be able to take month after month after month, 50,000 new customers like it was nothing. So uh, there was in that simple little statement, man, there was an awful lot of things that had to go on to make that vision stay true or become true, number one, and stay true, number two. So and that gets to an interesting question, Doug. Charles is talking about, you know, the vision is typically I want to flip the company in five years or some internal thing. But good vision statements, in my experience, are really about not about the company. It's about the effect the company has on the outside world. Any hints on how to kind of guide to that kind of a vision as opposed to make $50,000 a day kind of a vision? Yeah, I do. The um, Some of this, some of this we'll, we'll get into some of the visioning tools that are that are built into the into the piece but one of the things that that i one question that i like is what do you want the company to really be known for um a variation on that came from your your buddy and mine mike Sleppin, who used to ask the question if i gave you the an opportunity to put a billboard on the top of, uh, you know, on a, on a relatively high building in your town. And it was gonna flash a, the message 24 seven for years on end. What, what would you really want that billboard to say? What is it that you really wanna be, be known for or really be, get all, you know, become all about? And that led to a lot of, of, of discussion and, and kind, of, kind of how positioning that. 
Uh, Mike, similar to yourself, I love it when a vision is timeless. That um, that to me means that we're, what, what they really settled on is kind of a North Star, that they're always walking towards that North Star and it'll be as true in 2775, you know, as it, as it is, you know, three months from now. Tom? So there is a, was a book circulating through the network, and I think it was Erdliger inspired, called The On Purpose Business, okay. Kevin W. McCarthy. And in that book, it's a really, it's a parable about holistic strategic thinking. And he proposes a purpose statement. In addition to a vision statement and a mission statement, why do we exist? And it does address the lens of the customer. Um, and his purpose statement uh, was very simple, five, a prefix with five words and then two blanks. We exist to serve by blanking blank. Um, and I work with a company that made <laughs> rocks. In effect, they, uh, they, uh, they were a limestone company. They made keystones, capstones, cornerstones, and in effect, their purpose statement, because I use this in their strategic thinking, was we exist to serve by building reputations. They work with masonry contractors, and by, by delivering on time and delivering quality, they were able, able to elevate the reputations of those they serve who were masonry contractors. And so that little book, it's a 90-minute parable read, simple read, but you can just take and say, okay, at the essence, what's the essence of our service model? Who do we serve? And when we serve them, what happens? So that, that was a great resource. And back when I was doing this a fair amount, I, I added a purpose statement with just using that five word statement. Got it. Thanks. That's a cool little ad. Um, I've, got, I've got 357. So I want to wrap up on a couple of things. Um, the visioning tools piece that you have in the in the workbook is a whole series of questions that help people get past the blank white page syndrome for vision because a lot of times you give anybody a blank piece of paper and say write anything you want and they go into brain freeze and i found that same thing on the vision piece <clears throat> so instead by Kind of, kind of offering all kinds of little questions here, that it that it helps them kind of chunk it down into stuff that's not quite as overwhelming. And, and for example, um, when it comes to how many, there's a question in there: how many employees do you have? And you know, think think about it as a straight question, not as any kind of um, goofy question. You know, I, I'm just going to, I give, oftentimes I give people a series of numbers, you know, do you want to be a five person company, a 50 person company, a 500 person company, a 5,000 person company, a 50,000 person company? I mean, yeah, I'm just adding a zero, but oftentimes somebody goes, stop, I cannot see myself ever running an organization of fill in the blank. Okay. I mean, then they've just kind of, they've just kind of framed They've just kind of framed. Okay, that's kind of the that's the scope that they're currently comfortable operating in. Um, it's it's funny. A lot of times, if I if I get to a five hundred number, five hundred number might as well be five hundred and fifty five thousand employees. I mean, it's like people got five hundred. Are you kidding me? Running a five hundred person company? Oh my god! You know, it's 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 almost beyond their their capacity to even imagine let alone trying to run um but again i i just try to ask them these series of questions just to try to make it easy for them to kind of get their mind kind of kind of moving it from a a theoretical discussion more to how how would these kinds of things uh more more or less likely to play out so i've got 359 i'm, I'm only on until four but if you if you like this and you want to join me for part two, pay attention to the emails that come out from Wendy. But thank you for uh, joining me, and I'll try to pick this next one up in terms of the 
you know, part two, starting at the divisioning tools. For those of you who are following along in your book, we made it all the way to page eight. Thank you, Doug. All righty. Goodbye, Thank all. Thanks, Doug.